We suffered a great deal when we, the Makhatu people, were moved. Some of us had agreed to leave, and when they began to pack up, the lorries arrived. They were taken away, and their houses were demolished. But behind our bags, they began to demolish our houses as well. They were destroyed very quickly. There were soldiers with guns and dogs chasing us. As I ran, I saw them beating a man. He was outnumbered three to one by white men who were hitting him with their rifle bats. They had two dogs with them. Then they turned on a woman who had just given birth to a baby. They throttled her against the wall of her house and then they took her to Cromwell. Some of us ran away. In the confusion, some children were left in the houses. They even took away mothers, leaving newly born babies behind. We felt that we could not survive this butchery. Our houses were lying in ruins, totally destroyed. We complained to the police, but they said there was nothing we could do. You have been sold out. Chief Mahato sold you out. Our chief lied to the wise, and he admitted that he took the money. We have suffered. Right now, Machaka is protecting us, giving us a place to sleep. We demand homes. We demand homes for our children. We demand schools. Since we women were fighting this war, we said, if you have come to get us, we will take you on. Then they realized that they were powerless because we resisted them. And we told them that we were prepared to die rather than we moved. We have defeated them. These people, the Batlokwa, have defied the South African armed police and soldiers and have refused to be moved to a Bantustan reserve over a hundred kilometers away. Despite this resistance, the state still plans to go ahead with the removal of 80,000 Batloka living in the northern Transvaal. Mass forcible removals like this are an essential part of the apartheid master plan. Over six and a half million black people have already been moved, some from homes like these, and several million still face removal. All over South Africa, tin houses and tin toilets are being prepared. These are the camps which will receive the millions of black South Africans who are losing their homes. They are being forcibly removed to homelands they have often never seen. In Zulu, they say, Abaputriwe. It means the dispossessed. <laughs> Nearly 60 years after this statement was made, black workers like these men are still not permitted to enter the cities without a work permit. They are not allowed to bring their families with them. They must still carry a passbook, and they cannot choose their jobs nor what wage they will be paid. Every aspect of their lives is controlled by the state. Today, far from being phased out, apartheid has been ruthlessly enforced. But despite intimidation, black people have never submitted to this oppression without a struggle. And now the intensity of their resistance is increasing, spurred on by the liberation of Angola, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Political stability has been shaken as strikes and boycotts spread throughout the country. Foreign companies have threatened to withdraw their investment. In June 1980, the route squad were ordered to shoot to kill, but the state realizes that it cannot rule by the gun alone. These black people are privileged. The tiny minority of Africans who have rights to live in the city permanently are now needed by industry as skilled workers. They are to form a new labor aristocracy and have been granted 99-year leasehold housing, training for skilled work, and an assurance of full employment. In this way, the state hopes to create a buffer against black discontent.
but the vast majority of black workers have no hope of enjoying a game of tennis, for they are the victims of the state's intensified policy of labor control, a policy whose main aim is to keep wages low. Black labor is cheap in South Africa. Many hundreds of overseas companies benefit from investment in apartheid. By law, almost all African workers, men and women, are migrants on short-term contracts of one year or less. They have no job security, striking is illegal, and profit rates are amongst the highest in the world. I have to check 200 cases a day from half past seven to four o'clock, standing all the time for 12 grand a week. The prices of that Jesus, the cheapest was 22 rand, up to 49. And that is where I proved that, I really proved that being a black man in South Africa is more or less than to be a dog. Because I proved all the exploitation, or oh, only found out, oh, these people are really gaining, but I'm gaining nothing, only exploitation. I was not being paid even the price of one jersey per week, but I have to check 200 jerseys per day. This woman, like many thousands of others, has left the countryside in violation of influx control laws. These laws stop people coming to the city in search of work. She has obtained work illegally. As part of its attempt to tighten up its control over labor, the state is now trying to purge the illegal workers and to close the loopholes that have allowed them into the cities. To me, the law known as influx control is causing restless nights, restless nights. I've been caught several times. If you come from Transkai, being a married woman, feel like joining and lead a family life, the inspectors, they come and they catch us and we are being fined for being in Cape Town illegally. Being a, a woman, you are ordered to leave Cape Town within 24 hours. This man is fortunate. He can work in the city legally, but he will run to work rather than risk being late and losing his job. For outside the factory gates, hundreds of unemployed men are ready to take his place. Can you tell me what you're doing here? Oh, me, I'm looking for a job. Have you been out of work for long? Yeah, quite a long time. How long? For one and a half years. And you? Yeah, I've been unemployed man for three years. For three years? Yes. So you're here every day? Every day I'm here. Well, uh, I haven't got the unemployment card. We must go at the back doors to the employers of the firms to give them 10 rand so that I can be employed. So that's why we suffer like this. The threat of unemployment is the main obstacle in the workers' struggle for higher wages. Even during the economic prosperity of the 60s, Black unemployment remained very high. But in the last decade, owing to the increased use of machinery in industry, unemployment has approached crisis proportions. Today, it has reached levels of over 25%. And although they are important in the maintenance of low wages, the unemployed, frustrated and desperate are now a threat to political stability. Unemployment is not unique to South Africa, but the solution adopted by the state is unique. Just as with the illegal workers, it is deporting the unemployed from the cities on a massive scale. Every week, buses and vans make the 1,000-kilometer journey taking people from the black ghettos of Cape Town to the rural areas of the Transkai and Siskai. They return just as heavily loaded, bringing a new influx of people who have found it impossible to cope with life in the reserves, without money, without food, without hope. More and more people are now being forced to leave the cities. And although in the past they were able to come back, even if illegally, it is now not going to be so easy to escape the reserves. Mm -hmm.
These are the reserves, the dumping grounds where black South Africans are forced to live. They cannot live except to work on contract in white South Africa. Scattered over the northern and eastern parts of the country, these poverty-stricken areas will eventually comprise only 13% of the land areas of South Africa. These are the labor reservoirs created to serve the needs of the white economy. And as such, they will never share the wealth which black workers have created in white South Africa. Often toilets are the only provision made for people who are resettled in these areas. Death rates from disease and malnutrition are shockingly high. But if all goes according to plan, disease, squalor and rural poverty will no longer be found in South Africa. For these areas are now being granted independence. And now, I ask the Chief Minister to accept on behalf of the citizens of Bupulteshwana the symbol of your independence and sovereignty, namely a copy of the status of Bupulteshwana Act 1977 and the pen of gold which was used to sign and enacted. Uh, thank you. In 1977, Ruputatswana was the second reserve to accept independence. The granting of independence is the culmination of the policy which seeks to keep South African wealth in white hands. And just before midnight, the ceremonial lowering of the South African flag is accompanied by the national anthem. This ceremony broadcast throughout South Africa was designed to give the impression that Bukutatswana was now a fully independent African state. This charade failed even to impress South Africa's allies in the Western world. The plan calls for each African language group to be allocated its own Bantustan reserve with its own black government. And although this self-government attempts to satisfy black political demands, in reality, the loss of South African citizenship means that black people have become foreigners in their own land. 65% of Buputatswana citizens do not live or work in Buputatswana. Black unity is undermined by the fragmentation of the population on ethnic lines. And most important of all, the Bantustan's role as labor reserves will remain unchanged. To ensure that this policy works, Removals of blacks to the reserves must go ahead at all cost. This is Mother Dam, a camp on the outskirts of Cape Town where several thousand African and colored people lived together in defiance of the principles of separate development. The camp was demolished in three days, and attempts were made to force the African residents to leave the city and to go to the Transkai Reserve, over a thousand kilometers away. This is Glenmore, a new resettlement camp on the borders of the Siskai. Three thousand people are housed on this barren land, 45 kilometers from the nearest town. The residents of Glenmore are the victims of the policy of influx control. They are old people, unemployed men, women and children who were removed from their homes on the outskirts of white towns in the Eastern Cape in 1979. Since we were moved here, we have never been happy. We were happy at Clipfontein, where we lived before. We were brought here against our will. Our furniture was thrown into trucks and was broken, and our chickens died. Our furniture was ruined. When we arrived here, our cattle also died. We became sick from the polluted water. As soon as you drink this water, you develop diarrhea. 
Things are expensive in the local shop. It's expensive to go to Grahamstown and it's too far to walk. We last had work seven months ago. That was in June 1979. We stopped working then. And we haven't had work since. Not at all. Not even contract work. There is none. We wait in vain for work. And the rations we get, they are not enough. So we starve. We were poor before, but never this poor. Some people get very little food. As for us pensioners, we don't qualify to get rations. What are we pensioners going to eat here? Where we came from, we used to plow and grow food so that we had enough to eat. Our families on the farms could give us food. We do not depend completely on our pensions. Here we are starving. We are not at peace. There is hardly a person who is happy here. We don't want to be here. That is all I can say. We are dying here. People didn't seem to die at such a frightening rate where we came from. Even as I am talking to you, we are digging graves for those who died this week. But higher death rates, rural poverty and unemployment are not accidental. They are the intentional outcome of decades of massive resettlement programs undertaken by the state. These programs have resulted in extreme overpopulation of the reserves. There is not enough grazing for cattle, and even subsistence farming has become impossible. No longer able to provide for their own needs, black people must now try to find work. But there is very little work in the reserves. That which does exist is found in a few small labor-intensive industries like this brickworks near the resettlement camp at Sada. Wages and conditions here are even worse than in the cities. Because of the scarcity of work in the reserves, black people are forced to wait until they are recruited by white employers. By the time this happens, they are so desperate that they will accept any work at any wage. Here on the farms we have a hard life. I have to employ two young boys to work on my behalf for six months, paying them 100 rands each. This man is a labor tenant. In return for the rights to live on this land, he and his family are expected to work for the white farmer for six months every year without being paid. His children are too young so he must employ two boys to help him work his rent. There are still 400,000 African people living on white farms in conditions like these. But labor tenancy is being phased out. Increased use of machinery on the farms is resulting in many labor tenants becoming superfluous to the farmer's needs. And in line with its overall policy, the state wants to ensure that farm workers as well will become contract workers. One and a half million labor tenants have already been resettled in the reserves. Those workers who will be permitted to remain on the farms will not be tenants, but wage workers with no rights in white South Africa. At Mona Farm, it was first ten, but now only seven families have to leave. But all of us have children who are working for the white owner, Mr. Schroeder. 
good numbers in Asia. Manja ye Kenya nda was funu gya kono ngo bale nda ole ya saza le lokho. We are all told to go to Nandwe. Why must we go there? Why can't we stay here where our ancestors came from? I think that we have been here since the war between the Boers and the British. This place they talk about, Nondwe. We don't want to go there. Farmers were also anxious to get rid of labor tenants since they resented having Africans living on even the barren parts of their farms. They knew that they would not be losing their access to cheap labor, for there was an even cheaper source, black women and children trapped and starving in the nearby reserves. For 12 hours work in the fields, this girl has earned a few bruised vegetables. Women and children starving in the wretchedly overcrowded reserves, are willing to work for white farmers in return for food alone. These children go straight from home to the fields, and few have ever seen the inside of a classroom. Of many people that suffered during uh, their removal to, to Plano. But not even schooling would help black children rise above their future role as cheap, unskilled workers. It is school children like these who, in protest against the inferior education they receive, organized mass school boycotts in recent years. This school, like many others, has to provide an afternoon session because of the shortage of classrooms and teachers. But there are still over 60 children in each class. Black people are expected to bear the costly burden of their children's schooling. In some cases, as in the Winterfeld in Puputatswana, School facilities are so inadequate that classes are held in corrugated iron shacks. At other schools in the reserves, lessons have to be held outside because of the shortage of classrooms. Only a short distance away from this school, in the nearby town of Ladysmith, this white school has been standing empty since it was built three years ago. Built at a cost of one and a half million rand for an anticipated expansion of the white school population which never occurred. But black education serves another purpose. Because most black schools are in the reserves, African children are forced to be educated there, even if they were born in the cities. This ensures that they will ultimately join the ranks of the unemployed in the long wait for contract work. But African people did not always live in poverty. Peasant farmers like this man used to own their own land and kept large herds of cattle. They were prosperous cultivators. But in order to force them to work on the mines and in the factories, the state has systematically stripped them of their land and moved them into rural slums in the reserves. These are the ruins of what was once a community of African farmers who owned land at vetted labors in the white area of South Africa. In 1977, their homes were bulldozed. Only a chicken coop was left standing. They were moved 400 kilometers to Ekukanyusweni, where they were settled in flimsy shacks without land to plow and without grazing for their cattle. I was one of the people who came from Vetekle Bos. We are compelled to leave against our will. They brought soldiers to force us off our land. We are surprised because that was our place that our fathers and grandfathers fought for. Queen Victoria granted it to us because we fought for her. When we removed from Veda Clay Boss, our oxen and our arable land were confiscated. Then we were forced to move here to Kiskamahu. Although we didn't want to move, we could not show much resistance against people who were carrying guns. Stripped of his land and cattle, this man from Egukanyusweni is now forced to work in Humansdorp, a white town far from the camp. We were forcefully removed from Vita Klepos by the South African army. We were arrested because we were resisting 
been moved to a place we didn't know. Our property was loaded onto government trucks illegally. Most of our belongings were damaged. We're living happily at Vita Klebos, near Tsitsikama. At Case Kamawuk, we no longer have cattle. Only our belongings are left. Our old people are dying there. And even our children are dying. This place we have been moved to is foreign to us. There are no jobs, and we virtually live on water. We used to have many things, cattle, household things, which we don't have anymore. We now have to struggle, whereas we used to have a good life at Vita Klebos. We can no longer farm, and we can't find work. Those who resisted the move were jailed by the police. We didn't want to go to that place, but we were caught and forcefully moved there. Now we can no longer go to where we used to live without permits. Today we get arrested if we come here. Where we are now, we cannot move about freely. We have to accept contract labor. Working away from home means that your family waits for weeks without food until money arrives, something that never happened before. Previously, I used to sleep and wake up in my own home. I could do what I wanted to do. It was freedom, but not anymore. Now we're suffering. I have to stay in this hostel. It is as though I have been sentenced. I long for my family. In the cities, men are kept in hostels and compounds by the state and their employers. The compound system allows control over the workers at all times of day or night, even when they are not working. This abandoned mine compound in Johannesburg is being done up. It is to receive a new batch of workers who are needed to work on a gold mine which was disused until recently. Now, because of the increased price of gold, it is once again profitable to mine. And the mining company, like all employers of black workers, will be assured of a ready source of labor for their operations at a price which can hardly be bettered anywhere in the world. With nothing more to lose, black resistance to the state's resettlement programs is increasing. Here in Port Elizabeth, the black civic organization, PEPCO, organized mass protests in January 1980 against the proposed removal of the township of Walmart. The state's response was to detain and ban the leadership of PEPCO. Despite the banning of open-air public meetings since 1976, black residents of Port Elizabeth still protested against these detentions. The state has consistently used the police to crush all black opposition to its policies. At the slightest sign of protest, whether it be from school children or from people protesting against being moved, the state has claimed that this is the work of agitators and have sent in the paramilitary route squad. This is what happened to the residents of Walmart Township when they resisted being moved. The thing that made me scared was on Thursday, it was Thursday, Thursday night. While I was here at home from work, I was standing on the table on the corner of the smoking a cigarette. And one of my brothers, my younger brother, came running and he said, do you hear the shots? And we opened the door, wanting to have a look outside. And my sister remembered there were children outside. And she went outside to fetch the children. And at the same time, the thing started burning inside on my nose. And when I noticed my mother sitting there where she is sitting now, she started vomiting. And I went to her, and there came my sister with a baby. Someone came and shouted, it's tear gas, 
and I remembered water. And I went into the kitchen. We have um, we have bowls there full of water. And I started dipping cloths in the water. And I ran straight to my mother while she was vomiting. And I, I splashed her with water. All the way I splashed her with water. From my mother to my sister. From my sister to my to my uh, young brothers, to the little children. Is it necessary for them, for the, for the police, to use tear gas while there are children playing around the street? This film was made by the South African government to show the world the power of its armed forces. In a country of vast spaces, mechanized forces are a prerequisite for adequate defense. South Africa has always been ready to fight for her independence, no matter what the odds, and has always had the ability to adapt herself to circumstances. But these circumstances are not an impending invasion by a hostile neighboring state. South Africa is arming itself in preparation for a civil war against black South Africans. Military expenditure has multiplied eight times over the past 10 years, reaching 2,000 million rand in 1979. In spite of the rapid increase in military strength, resistance continues. The Natal bus boycott was supported by thousands of workers living in commuter towns in the reserves. Workers who have been moved out of white towns into the reserve commuter towns must travel long distances to work each day. They are forced to bear the costs of their resettlement. Historically, transport costs have been an important site of resistance in South Africa. In September 1979, the Natal bus boycotts were a major protest against increased fares. 10,000 workers in the recently established town of Ezakene left their homes at 3 o'clock every morning for several weeks in order to walk the 20 kilometers to Ladysmith where they work. The boycott spread to Mpumalanga, another resettlement area close to Durban. Despite the presence of armed road police, the buses ran empty for weeks and the boycott spread to many parts of Natal. The transport company was finally forced to abandon the increases after one of the most organized and effective campaigns in the country's industrial history. Organized resistance to the state's attempts to enforce its policies is increasing. Crossroads, the most well-known of South Africa's squatter camps, has been the site of a protracted struggle between the people and the state over plans to bulldoze the camp. Some of the people are refugees from other camps which were demolished. But so far, Crossroads has survived because of the well-organized resistance campaign led by its residence committees. Crossroads was struggling, 1974, the time we came to Crossroads, January. Inspectors from Brown's camp all over was coming to tell the people they must come at Crossroads because they are going to give them permits. They did collect the people all over in Cape Town, bush to bush. And then after that, they give them numbers. Women's Committee, did that arise at They time? give them numbers, and after that, they arrest them, sending them to Transcan, Siskai, all over. And then after that, women think that, hey, what are we going to do now? We have to do something which is going to help us. And November 75, women of Crossroad, they start to do something for themselves. Pass raids on the community persisted, but because of the strength of the resistance against police harassment, they were largely ineffective. Finally, the police mounted the notorious raid on the night of the 14th of September, 1978. Now, the night of the 14th of September, I remember we had a meeting, just a small meeting, to discuss about the school committee things, school things, and then we heard the rumors outside. Somebody called us and tell us that 
we must wake up because we, there's a rumors that they're going to come in, come arrest us, and then we say, we must spread out. Everybody must go. And then me as a chairwoman of the women's then I decided to take the loud hail and call all the women. And really, I did do that. I did go out to my house and call everybody. And then and my aim was to stand in one place. And then when they come in, they're going to collect us in one place. And it was exactly the same what I do. Well, that night, that city is that night on the 14th. And then when they came in the night, they asked us why we are wake up. Who told us that they're going to come in? And then we said we heard the dogs barking and everything. They were trying to shoot, and I mean they were trying to throw tear gas, and they were doing a lot of things. And so we were running up and down. But I told the woman not to run because if they cared. They were, some of the women were carrying some babies, and some of them were pregnant. So I told them not to run, they must stay in one place. If they are really want to arrest us, they must just take all of us. They mustn't leave anyone. So the men were also doing the same. The men were also in groups to watch for them. They must come in and come arrest. The men were the aim of the men wasn't to fight with them. They were the people who are coming in to fight, throw tear gas, shoot at everything. Said that night. And that night it was really a bad night. It was a Cold. It was about one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and then they stopped and they ran away and they shot a man. The man person was Mr. Jaila. But early in the morning they were coming back again. There were about hundreds and hundreds of vans. And then we decided that nobody must go, no one must go out in the camp. We must stay as we are. From the outside, the whole camp was full of men. They tried to beat the men and they would try to kick the men like dogs and they would try to pull the men down. Everybody was pulled just like a dog. Everybody had to run and cry and the children were falling down. Everything was just a mix and up and they were carrying big dogs. And they would tell the dogs to bite the people and the people were screaming. And then where I was running from, trying to tell the people, don't run away, stand. But the people were afraid because they were carrying guns. And we didn't have nothing put in our hands. Why I was calling the people, don't run, please stand. I look and then I saw them when they grabbed me. Our chairman and the noble one had thrown him like a stone. And they pulled our chairman to the bush. They were trying to shoot him. Everybody was taken to the vans. It was so bitter. Everybody was crying because we didn't know what's going on. We didn't do nothing. Just the sake of the paper, a fact. This was to be the last major raid on crossroads, since it was clear that even armed intervention would not force the people to move. In a refinement of the strategy, crossroads was given a six month stay of execution. Mrs. Luke, is crossroads still to be demolished? No. Why is that? It's because community is together at crossroads. We are not prepared to go anywhere and I want to go, we want to stay as family life as all the other nations. So what makes me to say that they are not prepared, I mean, they are, I don't trust them because I am a born of here, but through the government I have got no rights. The government is cruel and unfair. Do you think that the policy has changed? I don't trust them. Because I know them, I grow up. I, I, I grow up under them. They are always good today, tomorrow bad. I'm sorry to say that I have to say it. Because they say they don't want blacks to be here, so that's why I say I don't trust them. They are just bluffing us. If they did give us right, they wouldn't give us only six months. They would give us more than six months to show that they are accepting what we are asking from them, what, you, what we wishing to want from them. Now, there are people being moved from various places all over the country, and they're not given, being given permission to stay in the urban area. Why are the people of Crossroads being given special permission? It's because the community of Crossroads is strong, and the outsiders, the whole world knows what's going on in Crossroads. We as committee here, 
as women's committee and the men, we did try to send the message to the whole, all, the whole world because we, we are from South Africa, we are not from outsiders. We want to be here as family as all other nations. And another thing to go to the government of South Africa, they go over, overseas, they say, no, we are happy in South Africa. And there's no such. There's no such. They are just putting the front. They don't show the back. What happens if they come with guns to try to rip you? They can do. They can they do. usually do they it. Like. We are dead already. They can do it. Even to kick us. If they want to kick they us. Can do it. They can do it. They know that they want to do it. It's what they wish to do every day with the blacks. It's because they hate blacks. It's because they are cruel. Apartheid. 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 